Good afternoon. Welcome to the packed house that is the Fire and Emergency Management Committee hearing. Uh, I'm Council Member Joe Borelli and I'm Chair of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. I'm joined today by my colleagues. The Committee on Fire and Emergency Management primarily oversees the New York City Fire Department and the city's emergency medical services, which are principally responsible for firefighting, as well as first responder medical services. Regarding the subject of today's oversight hearing, we are here to discuss the city's emergency medical services response to the opioid epidemic. Uh, as EMTs and paramedic are often the first responders to encounter individuals experiencing drug overdoses uh, and adverse substance reactions, it is important for the council to examine EMS practices in this very important area. Specifically, the committee hopes to learn more about the fire department's efforts to ensure EMS workers are sufficiently equipped to respond to the growing number of drug overdoses that have been occurring in recent years. In addition to providing life-saving treatment following a drug overdose, what other ways can EMS better serve individuals with substance abuse disorder to ensure healthier living and helping people be referred to treatment when appropriate? Additionally, we are also hearing an unrelated piece of legislation at today's hearing, proposed introduction 1054, sponsored by myself and council members Cornegie and Yeager, to require the fire department establish a system uh, whereby individuals can submit fire alarm plan examinations to an, through an online portal. This would be an important step in streamlining, uh, streamlining a currently inefficient process uh, of submitting such plans in person. I would like to now ask those members of the administration who plan on testifying to please state your name for the record. Raise your right hands as the committee council administers the oath. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Proceed. Thank you. Thank you. And would you all mind introducing yourself uh, for the record? Elizabeth Cassio, FDMY Chief of Staff. Glenn Aceda, Chief Medical Director, the Office of Medical Affairs. James Booth, Chief of EMS Operations. Thomas McAvenor, Chief of Fire Prevention. Thank you. And I believe, uh, uh, Ms. Cassio, you will start. Thank you. Yes. Good morning, Chair Borelli and all council members present. My name is Elizabeth Cassio, and I am Chief of Staff for Commissioner Nigro of the New York City Fire Department. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you, with you today about the fire department's response to the opioid crisis. I am joined by Chief Booth, Chief of EMS, Thomas McAvenaugh, Chief of Fire Prevention, and Dr. Glenn Aceda, the Medical Director of Office of Medical Affairs. Nationally, we are in the midst of a drug overdose epidemic driven by both prescription and illicit opioids, primarily heroin and fentanyl. In New York City, drug overdose is the leading cause of unintentional injury death for all New Yorkers, and the leading cause of death among New Yorkers aged 25 to 34. In March 2017, the mayor launched Healing New York City, a comprehensive response to the opioid overdose epidemic, which aims to save as many as 400 lives by 2022. One of the key goals of Healing New York City is to prevent opioid overdose deaths by distributing naloxone, a life-saving drug that can reverse opioid overdose, to communities and social networks where risk of drug overdose is the highest. The city has pledged to distribute 100,000 naloxone kits per year, free of charge, and to ensure that people at highest risk of overdose and their friends, families, and social networks are equipped to prevent an overdose death. The fire department's role in that plan is the naloxone leave behind program. My testimony will focus on FDNY's approach to and the methods of dealing with suspected opioid overdoses. As far back as the 1970s, EMS paramedics carried and administered naloxone to patients with suspected overdoses. At that time, it was not easy to administer. However, as the technology evolved and naloxone became easier to administer, the department sought and received approval from New York State to allow emergency medical technicians, EMTs, and certified first responders, CFRs, to use naloxone to revive patients. As a result, all EMS personnel and CFR certified firefighters 
are able to administer the medication. FDNY EMTs and CFRs began administering naloxone in 2014. Our most recent advancement, announced in June of this year, has been leave-behind naloxone kits, which I will discuss in detail later in my testimony. When EMTs, paramedics, or CFRs encounter a patient whom they believe may have overdosed, they use their training and experience to make a decision about whether to administer naloxone. It's not practical or possible for them to conduct a blood test in the field, so they treat a patient for a suspected overdose based on several factors, including physical symptoms such as pinpoint pupils, credible information from a friend or witness, and the presence of drug paraphernalia. Upon determining that a patient may be overdosing on an opioid, naloxone will be administered like a nasal spray to revive and improve the patient's breathing. Subsequently, the patient will be transported to a hospital or medical center emergency room. Overdoses caused by stronger narcotics may require additional doses of naloxone. One trend that we have seen in recent years is overdoses caused by heroin contaminated with fentanyl. Fentanyl is a pain reliever that is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. We are aware of instances in other parts of the country of narcotics being mixed with carfentanil, which is intended as an anesthetic for large animals and is 10,000 times more potent than morphine. We check in on a regular basis with the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner and the De Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Poison Control Center to see if there have been any reports of carfentanil in New York City. Fortunately, to date, we have not seen any instances of carfentanil in the city. The Naloxone Leave Behind program allows EMS personnel to leave a naloxone kit with a patient or a patient's friend or family so that it may be used to revive the patient if he or she overdoses again in the future. Research indicates that people who have experienced a non-fatal overdose are at increased risk for experiencing another overdose in the future. Working with the de Blasio administration and DOHMH, the Leave Behind program enables our members to provide life-saving tools, as well as education and instructions that will prevent loss of life. Naloxone is being funded and supplied by DOHMH and is provided free of charge to patients and their friends and family. The process of preparing to go live with the Leave Behind program is itself a success story. FDNY registered with the New York State Department of Health Opioid Overdose Prevention Program in April 2018. Between April and August, working closely with DOHMH, we designed and implemented a training protocol. Using Diamond Plate, an online training platform that is located at every EMS station and firehouse, we successfully trained more than 4,000 EMS members in time to roll out the program on September 1st. And we did it without incurring extra training costs or using overtime. The kit itself is fairly simple. It contains naloxone nasal spray, rubber gloves, a face shield, alcohol wipes, a handout containing information on the risk of overdose, and an instruction sheet. Each basic life support and advanced life support unit is stocked with four kits for the Leave Behind program and are not used by the EMTs and paramedics for treatment. The kits are only distributed in instances where EMS personnel have already administered naloxone to the patient. When responding to a suspected opioid overdose, once the patient has been revived and is awake enough to receive a kit, the patient is offered a kit. If a patient declines to receive additional medical assistance after being revived, the patient may be offered a kit if approval is given by our online medical control doctors. A patient has a right to refuse the kit, and a patient who elopes from the scene is not given a kit. In addition, if a family member or friend of the patient requests a kit, 
a kit may be left behind with that person. Once the call is completed, the members update online medical control in order to track the distribution of leave behind kits. So far, we have distributed more than 30 kits to patients in the first few weeks of the program. Introduction 1054. Introduction 1054 sponsored by Chair Borelli would require the fire department to create a method to accept online applications for fire alarm plan examinations. The fire department puts a premium on customer service and in fact, we have been working on a program that would accomplish exactly what this bill would require. We know that providing online applications for fire alarm examinations would make the process more convenient for members of the public. And it is always our goal to improve the manner in which we serve the people of New York. We expect to be able to offer online applications for fire alarm examinations soon, and thus we support Introduction 1054. We would be happy to take your questions at this time. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess let's just stay on 1054 uh, at first so we can get that out of the way. Uh, just a quick question. What is the ETA on, uh, on rolling out the online application process? Well, we're currently working on the FIRES program, which is expen ex we're expecting it to roll it out on October 1st. We just, um, as part of the first release, there's a couple of units, and the fire alarm plan examination is the second piece of that in the first release. We are hoping by November 1st, we may need a little more time as we're working out some of the details relative to the final configuration and the reviews of uh, security, the software security clearance. And, and you don't see any uh, decrease in the quality of review? that the plan examiners would be able to give an online application versus a paper application? No, we don't, we don't expect any drop in the quality of the reviews. Okay. All right, so then just turning then to uh, opioids, um, I, I just want to start out by asking about diamond plate. It's something I never heard of. Sure. Uh, could you explain what that is? It's a method that we use to provide electronic remote training out of the classroom, out of the uh, proper classroom setting. Usually it's video-based. Sometimes it's uh, journal-based with questions, and uh, the members access it from the station. In the ideal world, we would have a mobile platform, but we don't have that at this time. Um, like something out of Star Trek, it sounds like. It's, um, we're dragging it into this century. That's good. Um, does the department track the number of EMS runs uh, stemming from drug overdoses? Yes. Is, is there an increase versus the 2017 numbers or uh, 2016? Do we have any trends to say whether we're responding to more or less? Actually, if we talk specific to opiate overdoses, because there are a uh, wider range of overdoses, so if we talk specific to opiate overdoses, uh, between July 2016 and June, the end of June 2017, we had 4,608 4, citywide. The same period from July 2017 to June of 2018, end of June, so we're talking fiscal year, citywide was 4,194. Okay, so it's fairly steady then, you say? Fairly steady. Um, is there a difference in the response to opioid uh, calls, whether it's an ALS or a BLS ambulance s uh, service? When you say difference, uh, are they do able you to mean offer the type of treatment that Correct. they would receive? Correct. So because of the naloxone, naloxone program and being able to administer the naloxone with the nasal spray rather than a, a needle, which is how the paramedics dis uh, administer naloxone, We've been able to bring naloxone to the patient more frequently because all of our providers are able to administer it. So, so, so the technology changed and now there's really no front end difference between ALS versus BLS? In, the, in respect to delivering naloxone to the patient. And uh, how many hours uh, of training do EMTs and paramedics receive uh, specifically on treating overdoses? They each receive a different amount of training time. Very reasonable. 
next question. Uh, I'm James Booth, I'm the Chief of uh, EMS Operations. The, the training that they receive is, is in their basic training and in their refresher training it has to do, it's a covenant of the medical emergencies. And uh, overdoses uh, are, are a, a subtopic of medical emergencies and opiates are a subtopic of, 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 the, uh, of that topic. So, uh, and they do uh, continuing medical education, uh, the paramedics do continuing medical education uh, so many number of hours per year in order to maintain their certifications. And you will see uh, journal articles that they have to read and take uh, questions uh, and, and, and pass those questions uh, in order to stay current on how to manage uh, somebody who has uh, not only uh, overdosed from an opioid, but there are other medications uh, also. So the, uh, I can't give you the actual number of hours. I know that we do uh, train on it. Um, it's buried in the original certifications and refresher. Is there a, is there a difference in uh, in response time, whether it's ALS or BLS service? A, 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 uh, a drug overdose can come in as a number of things. It could right. come in as a sick call. Um, it could come in as an unconscious. It could come in as somebody behaving irrationally. Um, so each one of those types of assignments are a different segment. There are um, nine segments, uh, response segments from cardiac arrest all the way up to a standby being the last segment. Um, and depending upon how that person is reported to the 911 system as be, when we interview the caller, um, that will dictate um, whether or not it's an ALS response or a BLS response. If they're unconscious, obviously we're gonna try to get the paramedics there as rapidly as possible, which is the ALS unit. If it's somebody who's not feeling well and it could come in as a sick or it could come in as a, history, a drug or alcohol abuse type assignment, which would be a lower segment, uh, non-life-threatening at that point, and it would be a BLS assignment. In, in any of these cases, is the, uh, is the corresponding engine company responding as well? On the higher level uh, assignments, uh, the unconscious, uh, you'll see the engine company turn out. Um, on the lower acuity patients where you'll see a sick call or you'll see somebody who's uh, acting irrational, you will not see the engine company turn out. Do, uh, do engine companies receive naloxone training as part of CFR? Yes, the engine companies are trained. They carry naloxone the same as the ambulance uh, carries it, and it's uh, delivered in the same method. Um, so congratulations on rolling out the, the Leave Behind uh, program. Um, I, I think it's something that is overdue and, and very well-intentioned and, and, and will probably lead to some, unfortunately, positive results. Um, is there follow-up? Is there? Any, do, do you take any data from the person that you leave the kit with, or is it sort of a no questions asked uh, uh, drop off? Yes, as part of the uh, New York State uh, Opiate Overdose Prevention Program, we actually come under this, the the City Department of Health and Mental uh, Hygiene, and uh, part of the requirements are uh, that we collect data, not personal information, because patient information is private and we can't uh, divulge that but essentially just for the purposes of where we seem to have trends of uh, where we leave these kits behind and such. So uh, very limited data sets we do provide. So with, with 43 given away so far, I think it's tough to, to pinpoint a trend. You know, maybe in next year's hearing we'll have more data. But do, have you noticed uh, borough-based discrepancies in the frequency of, of calls? Uh, and if so, are there ways to address that of opioid calls? Well, we mitigate the life-threatening aspect of opiate overdoses. Um, so there's not much that changes on that front, whether the call volume increases or decreases. Um, we do notice uh, sp st the spikes of uh, these types of calls to be in uh, the Bronx, Queens, Staten Island. So the uh, R Richmond County District Attorney um, has started a, a pretty robust program where they follow up with overdose uh, victims uh, to, to, to basically establish a, a lead on any type of criminal prosecution that could come from it. Uh, has there been any uh, discussion within the department of participating uh, or, or giving over any data of overdose patients or would that, would that breach HIPAA rules or? Most of the time these types of questions do breach HIPAA rules. And unless we got a piece of that law changed, I don't see how we're gonna be able to provide 
most of the data that people are looking for. But as I understand it, if the, if, if the police respond to the incident, then it can easily be given the information to the DA. Uh, so, so you're saying basically based on HIPAA, if it's just a medical situation, there's probably no way to refer the patient to the DA's office? Yes, it's very difficult. It's not part of the mandated reporting that we're required. For example, uh, if there's a shooting or a stabbing at the hospital, and that's mandated, and child abuse, things of that nature. Right now, since uh, opioid addiction is considered a medical um, uh, condition, it's not uh, something that we can divulge. So I mentioned we're joined by Councilmember Amphrey Samuel, uh, Councilmember Cabrera, and Councilmember Maisel. Um, yeah, should it be mandated uh, reporting, uh, uh, overdose treatment? Again, I think it's a medical condition. Um, you, usually there's no real criminal, criminal intent with someone's harm besides the patient uh, himself, herself. Um, technically, it would be against the law, but uh, uh, until legislation changes and such, right now it's not considered to be a mandated reporting piece. Do, do you think any sort of data collection from the Leave Behind program would uh, result in patients or family members being less interested in taking the kits? In other words, if they had to give their names and information over to... We would be speculating on experience and, you know, many uh, substance abusers are, are afraid to give their personal information. Um, they're afraid to tell us their names sometimes. They don't believe us when we say they're not in trouble. We do have those types of instances if that's what you're getting at. And we do have quite a few patients that once they wake up, they just kind of leave us uh, because they're afraid of the potential law, uh, the legal implications. But as a matter of policy, you believe it's better to make sure or, or encourage the patient as best as possible to leave with a kit rather than to... Absolutely. We do try to encourage them to not only, you know, take the kit, but let us take it to the but hospital taking, where we can, they can provide uh, even a higher level of care and can monitor you. Um, I just have... One more question back on intro 1054. Uh, our finance person uh, just gave me a great question. Uh, the, the policy that you're implementing uh, that, that corresponds with intro 1054, are you able to implement that with existing resources or are there more resources financially needed to implement it? Uh, we're expecting that we're going to need a uh, small group of additional resources to meet some of the demands. Uh, not just for, for this bill, but for s some of the others that are coming with alternate agent and um, the fire protection plan, but, but not, not, not a large number. We're, we're pretty much handling uh, all the fire alarm examinations with the folks that we have now, but the workload has increased such with the construction in New York City that uh, we may need to ask for a, a few more resources just to keep up with it. Sure. Uh, it formally it would be 10 days for when we would get the plan until we got to examine it. Now we're, we're somewhere in the area of two weeks, two to three weeks, so the, the plans are, are coming in at a high rate due to the construction in New York well, City. By, by the buildings department standards, that's like the flash, you know, like that's, that's incredible. Um, <laughs> uh, I, have, I have no questions. Do, do any of you f fine folks have questions? Yes, Council Member. Good afternoon. Um, just a quick follow-up to um, just the, the back end, the exchange related to when someone um, may refuse to be transported to the hospital. Um, what does that look like when they actually decline? Um, I have a um, all men shelter um, in my district and any, like every other weekend, I see about four ambulances in front of um, this particular facility on Eastern Parkway and Ralph Avenue, the Renaissance. And um, I've stood there and watched some of the men um, like just kind of come out of what's, what they're going through and then say, no, 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 and kind of like stagger off. And the EMS workers just kind of are standing there talking to the other guys. Um, and it's, it, 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 so what does that look like? Like what's the process or protocol? How long do they stay there um, um, to observe um, the individual? And like what's the level of encouragement to try to get them to to be transported, what does that look like? Yes, once we receive a call through the 911 system for, for any patient, we definitely try to get them to the hospital. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, public health law, as long as you have what we call decisional capacity, so you understand the risks and benefits of going or not going, we cannot force you to go to the hospital short of being uh, detained by the police and things of that nature, or being a threat to the public. Uh, sometimes they're, um, 
taken into custody by PD because they're just not making sense, they're a threat to others. But short of that, even someone having a massive heart attack uh, can actually refuse to be transported to the hospital. Uh, so we try to explain to them that, hey, if you, in that case, if you go to the hospital, there are these cath labs that might be able to prevent this, this uh, uh, damage to the heart, we really encourage that you go. So anytime there's a high risk uh, issue, we, we, our protocol is that the EMTs or paramedics must contact our online medical control facility, which has a physician uh, during any given 24 hour period, where a discussion will be had with the physician and the patient on a tape line recorded to say, listen, I'm not there with you, but from what's being described in the EKG that they just sent me, you're having a massive heart attack and we, you, you really no, need to go to the hospital. If you decide not to go, there's a great risk that you may actually become disabled or maybe even die. Uh, we try to let them know that this is a very life-threatening condition. At the end of it, if they still, with decisional capacity, and they understand that, oftentimes they'll say, well, if I'm gonna die, then I'd rather die at home, which is a difficult conversation to have, but we just cannot force them to go. And in those cases, after trying to encourage them, we will let them know on the tape line that this is a high risk case, high index of suspicion. You really should go. If you do not go, there may be consequences, and oftentimes we'll tell them what they are. And if they still understand that and refuse, then we'll have them sign our form. Uh, essentially, it says that they understand that and they refuse the medical transportation and assistance. And then we try to encourage them, listen, if you have pain again later, give us a call right back. We're happy to come back. Uh, and, and we definitely do try to encourage them to go. I'm not sure if you asked this question already, but um, do you leave any um, like pamphlets or like any information? Do they ha carry that with them in the in the ambulance? So I have okay. an example of what we leave behind for you. Um, I can show you what's in the kit. It has uh, a pamphlet on the use of the drug and the drugs that it works on and how to use it. But outside of the kit, like um, just other like like places they can go for treatment in the area or just a catchment area of where the, the ambulance is dispatched out of or, um, I don't know, clean syringe information and... Well, that's one of the reasons we encourage people to go to the hospital with us. The ambulance crew may not be from the local neighborhood. The ambulance crew may be relocated for the day, it may not be familiar with the area. So what we like to do is we like to encourage people to go to the hospital for two reasons. The first reason, they can receive services at the hospital that we can't offer them social services, referral, rehabilitation, and, and other, other medical services that they need for general health. The other issue is that if we've just given them Narcan, uh, naloxone, um, the half-life of the drug may be shorter than the half-life of the illicit substance or the prescription substance that they've accidentally abused. So the naloxone wears off and the other drug kicks in again. That's the, one of the reasons where we want to get somebody to the hospital because they can be observed and medically monitored. So we don't have, a, let's say, a relapse you know, down the road uh, an hour or two later uh, when the half-life of a drug uh, is shorter than the drug that you've taken. And I know you were asking in general, but for, for this kit, as Chief Booth mentions in the instruction sheet, there is some information about rehabilitation resources and such because we want to provide that. So in our discussion with the, the DOHMH, we were able to get that onto this sheet. Uh, I know you're asking specifically broadly, but at least for this part, we have that. And uh, how many languages is the uh, flyer translated into? I'd have to look at it and tell you. I see this one's in English, sir, the one that I have. Yes, but we are, uh, with DOHMH, we, they've translated into Spanish, so we're hoping to get that out, and I believe they said Russian mm -hmm. at the moment. So there's definitely a plan. So, sometimes in this building, if you blink, there's a, a new language flyer legislation that, that'll appear. Absolutely. But I, I'll just take your word that you're going to work towards translating it into more languages. We, we are, uh, through DOHMC, uh, MH, we are working on having it in different languages. Okay. Uh, and, and, I mean, I guess I should just ask this question on the record. Is there any uh, harm reduction advice given in the, in the kit or by the EMS responders? Needle exchange uh, sites or things like that? 
I, I, mean, I mean, when we, when we interact with somebody who, who we've given naloxone to and, and we, we, we try to do some education, you know, obviously we try to tell them that the behavior that they're engaging in is, is not something that's, you know, conducive with, uh, you know, uh, good lifestyle. Um, uh, and that's why we want to get them off to the hospital so there's a higher level of care where there's social workers who are trained and certified to help manage these individuals at a greater uh, level than the ambulance personnel can do. Okay, I, I have nothing else to ask. Uh, I just want to say thanks for bringing these. I actually, uh, in my neighborhood, I, I carry these in my car, which is pretty, uh, that's pretty sad to say. I haven't had to use it yet, thankfully, but there's always one in my car. So thank you very much for coming. So the next panel will be uh, Van Asher and uh, Carl Gandolfo. And if anyone else would like to testify on the bill, you could see the sergeant at arms. I guess we'll start from the gentleman to my right, your left. Okay. Good afternoon, my name is Van Asher. <laughs> this one, the gentleman with a gray suit. My refresher, uh, which I recently received my refresher EMS course, training, we discussed overdose and naloxone was a half hour to answer your previous question. That's the extent of the training. Um, one of the things, uh, David Tarantino, a senior medical advisor to the U.S. Custom Border Protection, just dispelled the myth that touching any amount of fentanyl is likely to cause severe illness, injury, or death, which I just wanted to address because there's been a lot of fear about possible death from accidental exposure from touching. And just having worked in syringe exchange for 26 years, I've probably been exposed to fentanyl several times unbeknownst to myself over the last several years and have no special in immunity. Um, and I've reversed several overdoses myself with no adverse effects. Um, I think we really need to take a moment and acknowledge with the spike in overdose death rate, that it's also a scary time to be a first responder. And it reminds me of early on in the HIV epidemic when people were afraid to provide CPR. And these were myths that we were both able to dispel. Um, people weren't becoming infected with HIV from performing mouth to mouth, and people aren't overdosing, treating people who are experiencing opioid overdose. Um, but hysteria, is an epidemic as well, and that's one that also needs to be quelled. It's much in the same way. Um, oftentimes, and, and correct me if I was wrong, it seemed that they said with the Leave Behind program, which is so needed and something I've been vying for for years, that if someone refuses to go to the hospital, that they are not given a kit, and that is the person that most needs the kit, because they're most likely to experience a fatal overdose. Um, and was, was that what was said? Okay, well, we'll check. Um, and I know, I know that once someone gets to the hospital, they're met by one of the Department of Health Wellness Advocates, and it is there that they're given information on harm reduction programs and centers, but there is no reason that that information cannot be given and put in a kit. And I think it is most important that the person that chooses not to go to the hospital, and people don't go to hospitals for several reasons. Um, historically, if you identify as a drug user, you're treated poorly. And the amount of stigma and shame that we attach to drug users only often increases drug use. 
Um, and we're seeing new people overdose fatally that we haven't before from the introduction of illicitly manufactured fentanyl being mixed in with the street drug supply. If we just look statistically in 2015, 10% of cocaine-related fatal overdoses that did not involve heroin involved fentanyl. In 2016, that number was 37%, which is a 61% increase. So there are people that use cocaine so infrequently they don't even consider themselves drug users that are at high risk for a massive opioid overdose. And that's staggering. Um, we're a drug using society. There are coffee cups all around us. Coffee used to be illegal. It's how we're taught to think about drugs. It's more about the lack of quality control. And 40% of the fatal overdoses that were related to opioids last year were from prescription medication. We also have an over-medicating problem that we're not talking about. Um, so if someone's refusing to go to the hospital, there's a slew of reasons. Their partner and families may not know about their drug use history. So if, let's say, I had an overdose and didn't want to go to the hospital, and I was with this gentleman, if you said, hey, we're going to give you guys a kit because the naloxone we gave you to reverse your overdose is only going to last 30 to 90 minutes, but the drugs you did are going to last longer, and you may continue to overdose when the naloxone wears off. So if you see your friend continue to overdose, you can save the life, their life, if you don't call 911 again. And what that'll do is also relieve some of the pressure from EMS returning back to a scene, which I know I've spoken to many EMS in certain states like Ohio. Um, they've been talking about not administering naloxone to people more than a few times, um, which is deciding who lives and dies. And that's kind of like saying we're not going to give people insulin more than a couple of times if we see the same people, which I can tell you as an EMT would see people with insulin-related situations several times because of their diet and not eating after taking insulin regularly. Um, I just wanted to say if EMS would leave naloxone with people that refuse to go to the hospital, and in there, there are inserts on harm reduction programs, and they take a moment to say, this is how to use the kit, aside from just having the insert in there, and it only takes about five minutes to do a really quick training, especially with someone that is a drug user that knows how to identify an overdose. This will do a couple of things. It's gonna cut down on accidental fatal overdose. It's gonna change how people who use drugs see EMS. It's gonna change how EMS treat people who use drugs because they're gonna realize that drug use is ubiquitous in New York and we're gonna see how more of the, pa we're gonna see more of the patient rather than the stigma behind drug use. And the long-term outcome will be people will be more likely to access EMS and have less fear because people are still afraid that if, let's say I overdose and my overdose is fatal and he placed the call, he may be treated as, a, I mean, even though the little blue card in there is supposed to um, exonerate you from prosecution, it's not in other states. Um, and people are still scared to call and report. So if EMS is working more in kind with people who use drugs, we can shift how people who use drugs see EMS. And if police would also do leave behind as well, because they see people every day on their beat they have relationships with that use drugs, that aren't necessarily overdosing, and they could go up to them and say, hey, I see you every day. I just, I'm not here to harass you. I just want to make sure, do you guys have naloxone kids? Because even though we don't know each other, I don't, I see you every day. I don't want to see you die. And that'll change the conversation and how people who use drugs see police and how they see other people in uniforms. And the last thing I want to say, additionally, if you want to prevent fatal overdose with opioids, we need to open more, or we need to open opioid prevention sites. There are over 100 worldwide. There has not been one single overdose fatality in any one of them. The mayor has approved four, 
Last year in the five boroughs, we had 1,441 fatal opioid-related overdoses, which is up from 1,374 the year before. This isn't going away, um, and if we want to save our fellow New Yorkers, it's just time for change. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, just to point out that the uh, FDNY does uh, leave the kits with people who refuse to go to the hospital. Okay. So just to, we, we found that out when you asked. We, we had somebody dig. Um, uh, next, uh, Carl or, or Oren, do you want to speak? I was running a little behind, so Carl was going to cover for me, so I'll go. Good afternoon. My name is Oren Barzalay, and I serve as president of Local 2507, which represents 4,200 uniformed emergency medical technicians, paramedics, and fire inspectors. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. As you are aware, no doubt, as you are well aware, EMS is on the front line of the ever-growing opioid crisis. Every seven hours, someone dies of a drug overdose in our city. More New Yorkers die of a drug overdose than homicides, suicides, and motor vehicle crashes combined. Overdose deaths in New York City have increased for six consecutive years. The desired long-term goal for opioid-addicted patients should be providing them with an opportunity to engage with mental health and substance abuse professionals who may be able to use addiction interaction techniques to help the patient agree to a drug treatment program. Stroke, heart attack, and trauma patients benefits, benefit from designated facilities and specialized treatment teams. Yet our only option for overdose treatment in traditional EMS model is to transport the patient to an emergency department that is unlikely to offer the type of recovery services the patient needs. The reality in EMS of treating an overdose is to provide initial resuscitation to a non-breathing victim. Narcon is resuscitation drug, not a treatment modality. Undoubtedly, Narcon administration is critical intervention to a non-breathing patient. However, Narcon, Narcan has a life has a half-life of 60 to 90 minutes. So therefore, Narcan is, in reality, a very short-term solution to a long-term epidemic problem. Patients who are arrived are revived via Narcan often refuse transportation or further intervention. A patient can, offer, can often become violent as they experience withdrawal symptoms. That combined with the never-ending volume of other requests for EMS response mitigates the ability of pre-hospital care providers to meaningfully engage the patient. If the goal of the council is to affect low-term solutions, not apply a pocket full of posies on a modern plague, I strongly suggest establishing opiate response teams. After compiling and anal analyzing demographic and geographical data, these teams could be deployed to neighborhoods with the highest incidence of reported overdoses. The team could consist of a police officer, an EMT who is trained in addiction counseling. This would allow a healthcare professional under the protection of a police officer to not only mitigate the immediate, the immediate medical emergency, but allow an adequate time to interact with the patient. Relieving the time consistent allow for an, for an attempt to navigate patients to treatment programs in designated emergency departments, discuss, discuss harm reduction strategies, and at least provide referrals for medical assistant treatment programs. This team could also engage in, long, in longer term or follow up interventions on a community based level. In closing, I look forward with with working with the council in, combat, in combating this crisis. Or just, just explain the, the idea for, for opioid response teams. Do any other municipalities do, do anything similar to that? There are other municipalities across the country that have opioid response teams. Is, is, there, is there like one that would like come to mind as like, like, like the example? San Francisco would come to mind. And it's the same thing where it's a police officer, healthcare professionals, Yes. Same thing. Is there any way you could forward us some information on it? 
Just okay. like San Francisco. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll do some research and get that, you. I, I think that's something the committee would would be interested in uh, in, in looking into in the future, uh, especially wh where you have on on Staten Island you have the Richmond County District Attorney's Office already trying to bring the law enforcement aspect into the uh, I into the overdose response, uh, and, and they've they've built some cases and they just took down uh, some some suppliers, which is a good thing. So, uh, uh, yeah. thank you, thank you guys, appreciate okay. it. That's it? Okay. Uh, my colleague has a comment to make. I apologize. I apologize. Sorry, sorry. That, yeah, just uh, thank you for your time today. I just want to rebut some of the things that the city actually got up here and testified uh, about or spoke about. I mean, there is a, a great difference between the ALS and the BLS care that is given for uh, overdose. And I know Chief Booth spoke a little bit about the training that goes into it and, and being, you know, paramedics being trained a little bit more. but. Uh, the difference in New York City protocols, and you can reference it via the New York City REMSCO website, is that, <coughs> excuse me, at the CFR BLS level, you're instructed to administer one milligram either uh, or via intranasal route, which is a little bit more than what the medics uh, administer, whether it's given IV or it's given IN or, 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 I, or intramuscular, um, which brings up upon a host of problems, and I know Warren had referenced it in his testimony as well, about the violence and, and the 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 patient actually coming out of a withdrawal and becoming violent, which is a problem for us. So, you know, I, I think going forward with this, uh, we're also, uh, just to speak about the ALSK, you're all, we're also able to intubate patients, which is we put a breathing tube basically down their throat into their lungs. We're able to monitor their oxygen saturation level, which is, isn't available for all the BLS crews that are out there. So there's definitely things that the or steps the department can take. Uh, you know, uh, we look forward to working with them and, and of course, with your committee as well in, in getting us some of the technology that might be necessary for it. Um, but the education is the most important thing that I think we need to do going forward. Being instructor myself, you see the very limited amount of time that we're given even to do the, the, the CME or the continuing medical education on the leave behind kits, which is important and it's a vital thing to, to have out there obviously. Um, and just to touch on that very quickly, Anybody that overdoses gets an Arcan kit, whether they are left on scene and they refuse to go to the hospital or if they're transported to the hospital. The thing that we're not giving them are the services that they need, which would be a needle exchange program information, uh, counseling, uh, short-term rehab, even as Oren testified that there are very few hospitals that offer outpatient or rehab facilities or even a detox facility. I know most of the city hospitals, and I don't want to speak out of term here uh, for HHC, but they offer them, but what we need to do is we need to educate our EMTs and our paramedics on uh, the, the aftercare that we don't really get to do. I just stopped the, the councilwoman out in the hall because the facility she was referring to is very well known to me and you know my colleagues from you know my career days when I was on the street working in uh, Brooklyn, it's 599 Ralph as a men's shelter. And very often we're not given the opportunity because we don't have the proper education. I think the department can go, a little, go forward a little bit more in training us and giving us the information that we need to give to the patients that are on the street. You know, I can tell you all of the stroke centers in New York. I can tell you all of the trauma centers, the replant, the burn centers, the cardiac catheterization centers, but I can't tell you where all the rehabs are. And, and that's a problem. I mean, treatment obviously is something that needs to be done. The aftercare when they get out of the hospital, I, I understand that they connect them with social workers, but it's the aftercare when they get out of the hospital. And from my studies with addiction, it, it's when the, the addict, quote unquote, if we want to call them that, when they're ready to get treated, they're going to get treated. So we have to continue to plant that seed and give them the information that they need and give them all the resources that are available, you know, that the city has to provide for them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and just next uh, one other thing, I'm sorry. And it's now one person every six hours instead of every seven. Okay. So it's one person every six hours? Yeah, one fatality every six hours now. The city. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the last panel is Mr. Uh, Dave uh, Samuels. We're switching gears, I believe, to 1054. Good to see you again, and you can begin. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm David Samuels. Uh, I'm an electrical contractor. I'm sorry? Just speak into it a bit more. Sure. Thank you. 
My name is David Samuels. I'm an electrical contractor. I represent the New York Electrical Contractors Association and some affiliated associations. Um, as a contractor, uh, we're concerned with the installation of those plans that have been approved by the fire department. And uh, our concerns are not in terms of design or um, a filing for plan examinations. Uh, our business is primarily with the Bureau of Fire Prevention, and what we have to do is install the work that is specified on those plans that are examined and approved, and then we must be inspected to see that we have, in fact, conformed to the plans and specifications. And what I'm here today to request is that this legislation be expanded so that we can be part of this online process. It's, it's very important to us that we conform to our contracts with our builders and, and uh, customers, and at the same time comply with FDNY's uh, plan specs and requirements. Um, every contract of any magnitude has clauses in it that says time is of essence. And it's very important to us to be able to complete our work on time accurately and to be able to demonstrate that those fire alarm systems that we have installed are in fact operational and conform uh, to the plans and specifications and are done in time for the customer of our contractors to utilize their space. Um, heretofore, uh, we have had the ability to file inspections online, but unknown to us, it, 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 it stopped. Uh, presently, in order for an electrical, a licensed electrical contractor to uh, apply for an inspection date requires that a person travel to Metrotech in Brooklyn on, on four or five days a week <clears throat> and, and make application for up to three inspections on one day. If there's five inspections, you must come back the second day to, to, to file for two more applications. Um, this process um, is, is um, it's old. Um, we have public safety issues here that we've addressed with the Department of Buildings in, in a uh, online situation, which has worked very smoothly. And um, we've had the ability to meet with the Bureau of Fire Prote uh, Prevention and discuss many issues, uh, this included. Um, the Bureau uh, has attempted to, to do this, but in, for some reason, there has never been a follow through. So we're, we're imploring the city to incorporate the inspection aspect of filing in this new uh, computerization. Um, it, the the uh, situation for contractors has been that every year the backlog of uninspected work continues to increase, and that's very uh, concerning to us. Uh, my particular firm is operating in New York City for 90 years. Um, our aspect of the uh, electrical construction industry is interior alterations, and most of our work is in Manhattan, and um, our staff is in the neighborhood of 200 people, and it's not uncommon for us to perform between 1,200 and 1,500 uh, installations a year, and a very high percentage of these require uh, inspections. Um, included in the handout today on the last page is an application showing those uh, components that must be presented to the fire department. If I could make an analogy of a chain holding a heavy weight, um, every link in that chain is necessary to sustain the, the load. And we have a multifaceted uh, process in terms of being inspected. Uh, we must uh, submit uh, seven different kinds of documentation uh, we, we require uh, a signed as-built drawing from the engineer of record. Um, many times our, our inspection takes place on overtime, and it's necessary to assemble associated contractors, which, whether they're HVAC, equipment manufacturers, uh, uh, kitchen equipment, and so forth, the building personnel, the contractor's representative, 
And, and in fact, if anything goes askance, any document is wrong or it's missing or, or the inspector can't make it, there's a, there's a, a hugely expensive situation that occurs in it and it has to be redone. So that we believe that with the uh, inst inst incorporation, excuse me, the incorporation of this online process that we can expedite errors, omissions, and, and make sure that the communication is, is uh, excellent. Um, it, it would be very important to all of us in the electrical contracting industry to have this uh, modernization incorporated and we, we uh, would hope in the future that we can continue to have the dialogue that we've had with the Bureau of Prevention and the Fire Department and uh, are thankful that we can have these, these conversations. Um, the, the handout that I will not read to you because it doesn't have that much appeal, frankly. It's, it's factual. Uh, some of the facts are a little bit uh, hyperbolic, but nonetheless, they're accurate. And um, I, I would remind uh, the council uh, that the inspection department is fee-driven. It has the ability to have significant income, and it can have uh, a great, great uh, um, modernity from the, the use of those funds to, to expedite the process. Um, uh, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to address them. Uh, no, I mean, w were you encouraged at all with, with what they said today about uh, seeking to, to uh, w were you encouraged at all by what they said uh, in terms of seeking to uh, put as much stuff online as possible? Well, I, I think that the emphasis has been plan examination, and that's a, that's a, a function of, of design professionals, whether they're architects uh, or engineers. And, and we're in a different place in the fire department. We're in the Bureau of Fire Protection. Tech, technical services is a different group. The, the process of a fire alarm um, installation actually starts with the building department. And when they provide a, a, a approval of the concept, then the drawings that are designed by the fire professional, the uh, engineer or architect, are sent to the fire department for review. And when those plans are reviewed, they're then able to be uh, disseminated for estimation and then award and installation. After the installation is completed, we request an inspection so that, in fact, the, the inspector comes and sees that that design has been conformed with and, and it functions properly. Thank you, Mr. Samuels, and thank you for your honest assessment of your prepared uh, remarks. Thank <laughs> you, sir. Most appreciated. Thank you. Is there any other uh, individuals willing to testify? Seeing none, thank you. The meeting is adjourned.